Hello everyone and welcome to our um, webinar. Thank you so much for joining and good afternoon. My name is George and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you today as we're going to be exploring a recent um, report um, which is entitled Exploring the New World, Practical Insights into Funding, Commissioning and Managing Complexity and written by um, some of our colleagues who are joining us today at Newcastle Business School and Collaborate CIC. Um, I'm part of an organization called Kaleidoscope Health and Care, and we're hosting the digital event today. We're a nonprofit set up to bring people together to improve health and care. So as you can imagine, we're very obsessive about how people and indeed organizations collaborate and how we can increase the rigor and impact of collaborations and networks. And so accordingly, we were absolutely fascinated by the recent report and the ideas and thinking behind human learning systems and the framework and um, practical tips and opportunities it offers. And so we wanted to explore it further. And that's why um, we've invited our panelists today and set up our discussion. So um, before I start, let me offer a warm welcome to those of you who are joining us live. Um, thank you very much for taking part in this on a um, somewhat cloudy um, day here in London. And also, um, and it's always a bit fun to do this, I'd like to thank everyone who is joining us from the future. Um, <laughs> I hope it is a sunshiny place, um, but that is a, um, that, that's a way of saying that we are recording this um, so that folks can watch it um, from the future. So greetings to you in the future. Um, I'd also like to welcome our panelists today. Um, so from the top of the country, I'd like to introduce Toby, who's joining us from Newcastle. Toby, would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hi there, yeah, I'm uh, Toby Lowe. I'm a senior lecturer in public management and leadership uh, at Newcastle Business School here at Northumbria University. Uh, and kind of previously, I've been uh, a charity chief executive and worked for civil service and done various things between the public and voluntary sector. And thank you, Toby. Um, I must confess, we just had a little bit of an audio issue there, so I didn't get the full introduction. But um, I will um, uh, take it from your body language that you were able to introduce yourself. So thank you. And also, I'd like to introduce from the bottom of the country in Hastings, Claire. Um, Claire, do you mind um, saying a few words about yourself? No problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Claire Alcock. I'm also part, part of Kaleidoscope Health and Care, uh, having joined uh, Kaleidoscope at the end of last year. Uh, before that, I was a uh, commissioner in three CCGs in Sussex and Surrey, uh, where I was head of primary care and community development. And a bit of what I'm gonna say today uh, is reflecting on, on that experience. Uh, previously at the Health Foundation and uh, NHS England and Department of Health before that. Fantastic. Thank you, Claire. And um, last but not least, joining me live in the studio today, I'd like to introduce Dawn. Dawn. Thanks. Um, my name is Dawn Plimmer. I work for an organisation called Collaborate. We're a small social enterprise and we support places across the UK to collaborate um, across the system. So bringing together local authorities, health partners, voluntary sector and communities. Um, I've got a lot of um, previous experience in working for a range of different funders. So the, the issues we're discussing here about funding and complexity um, are something that I've been grappling with many, for many years. Fantastic. Thank you, Dawn. And um, we're very much seeing this as a conversation today. Um, so I would like to um, uh, ask all of the people who are joining us live today and make you aware that there's going to be three ways to participate and um, interact with us <coughs> here um, and um, the panelists who are joining virtually. So we will invite you to share reflections and questions in three ways. Number one, you can use the question box facility that's part of the little GoToWebinar control plan or interface on the right hand side of your screen. You can also email us with hello at, sorry, you can email us at hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare. And thirdly, you can use Twitter. And the hashtag that we're going to be using today is human learning systems, or one word after the hashtag human learning systems. So please join um, the conversation and ask questions and share reflections. We'll be hearing from our panelists um, each and then we will open it up for questions. So I'm um, very much looking forward to, to your reactions and insights. Fantastic. So um, before we go to questions, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to kick us off 
by sharing their perspectives on the report. And we're going to be starting with Toby. And Toby, I think you're going to be sharing a few slides. So I'll ask Nat to just pull them up now. Fantastic, we can see them there. So over to you, Toby. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what it means to work in complexity and what, when we understand that the world is complex, what that requires of us. Uh, so could we have the, the next slide, please? Ta -da. So I, I want to say something uh, about how we know we're in complex environments. So uh, because the the work that we've done is uh, en enables people to respond more effectively to the challenges of managing complexity. So how do we know when the world we're working in is complex? Well, we think we can recognize that complexity when the people that um, the work is trying to serve ha have a variety of strengths and needs and when those strengths and needs look different from different perspectives. So if the people that uh, your work is trying to help um, uh, have a kind of set of individual characteristics which means that the help and support that each person needs is different, then that's an indicator that you're in a complex environment. Uh, secondly, when the desired outcomes of the work that people are doing are produced not just by that work itself, but by many factors uh, interacting together in an ever-changing way. Uh, so, for example, if, you're, if the person that you're uh, working with is also being helped by a range of other organizations, if they're part of wider networks of family and uh, uh, civil society, and if those interactions are also important in producing the outcomes that uh, you care about, that's an indicator that you're in a complex environment. And second, uh, and finally, when your when people are working in systems that are beyond the control of any of the any one actor in that system. So, um, if the range of relationships that help produce an outcome aren't under the kind of single single management control of any one of the organisations. So that's that, that's a kind of quick run through of if. If the work that you do has any of those kind of characteristics, it's prob you're probably working in a complex environment. So next slide, please. And so I wanted to now to give a, a kind of a brief visualization of what it means to work in complexity. So this uh, is uh, this diagram. So it's one of my favorite diagrams in the world. Uh, it's an illustration of the systems map of obesity. It's what happens when you shut a bunch of public health experts in a room and tell them that they're not allowed to leave until they map all the causes of obesity and all the relationships between all those causes. And so what these public health experts did was they identified 108 different factors that lead to the outcome of obesity, so whether people are obese or not, and all the relationships between all those factors. So you can't see each of the individual factors on this diagram, they're too small, but you can see them summed up into things like early life experiences, food production and supply, education, media, the te technology, the nature of work, built environment, and healthcare and treatment options. And what this diagram shows is that any outcome that we care about is the product of all of these factors working together. So that outcomes are produced by whole systems not by individual interventions, not by projects, not by programs. And uh, next slide, please. And that has a really, really significant implication for uh, us people who are interested in uh, managing and commissioning in, in complex environments. And if there's one takeaway from what I'm saying today, it's, it's this idea that outcomes are not delivered by organizations. So the outcomes we desire are emergent properties of these co of complex systems. So they're produced by all the factors in the system interacting together. So if we conceive of outcomes as delivered by organizations, we will get outcomes wrong and it will be harder to produce real outcomes in the world. Next slide, please. And so just, I, I wanna finish by saying, if this is, if that's what a complex environment looks like, what does that require of us when we manage in complexity? Well, firstly, it means that we need to respond to variety. 
So uh, if each person's strengths and needs are different, our work response needs to be able to hear and understand those particular strengths and needs and to respond to each person's variety. Secondly, it means we need the ability to adapt and change because the whether our work is successful or not will be uh, uh, significantly affected by the context in which it works and the context in which it works and the people with whom we work are constantly changing. So that requires that the work constantly learns and adapts and evolves. The moment your work stops learning, it's, it's, it will stop working. And third, it requires us to be able to shape systems whose behavior we can't reliably predict and which no one controls. So this seems to me, uh, seems to us to be the challenges of working in complexity and what complexity requires of us. And now I'll hand over to Dawn to say a little bit about how some of the organizations that we've been working with respond to those challenges. Thanks, Toby. So yeah, if, on this slide, we're just showing, um, charting the work that we've done so far. So the first work, um, report, A Whole New World, started to explore how are funders and commissioners thinking about complexity in their work? What are the challenges they're hitting up against? What are their recognition um, of complexity uh, are they, if they're finding for their work? Um, and then people engaged with this far more than we expected. And what we, we had a real um, request for was practical examples of what this looks like. Um, so this is, this is why we wrote the new report, Exploring the New World. And this drew on a lot of different examples um, coming from public service reform, coming from commissioning, coming from funding, and actually practice on the ground for the work of charities as well. Um, so I'm briefly going to talk through now what those features are that we're seeing emerge across all of these, these different spheres. So if we move on to the next slide, um, the three key features that we've identified are firstly, being human, secondly, constant learning and adaption, and thirdly, the idea of, of creating healthy systems. So I'm just going to briefly dig into two or three of those features. So if we start off, off with human, um, so when we spoke with people who are beginning to try and work in a more complexity friendly way, one of the first things they told us was, well, it's just about being human, really. It's just about treating people as people. Um, so we tried to delve a bit deeper into what this actually looked like. So it was at, at the first point is, is kind of responding to variety. So as Toby said, everyone's got different needs, different experiences, different strengths. They're operating in different contexts that are constantly changing. So commissioners, funders, organisations that are working in a complexity friendly way are trying to respond to that variety of, of people. Instead of a standardised response, it's about treating them as individuals. Linked to that, um, empathy is, is another key feature that we saw. So it's, it's about understanding people, about building relationships, about trying to understand where people are coming from and basing your response on that understanding and that trust. It's also about taking a strengths-based approach. So um, a lot of the organisations and places that we spoke to said, you know, a lot of this is about moving from a system that's based on deficits, a system that's based on fixing people, um, to a system that actually recognises people's strengths, builds on those strengths, builds on people's internal motivation. And the final feature that we saw um, is trust. So linked to that idea of empathy, um, building relationships, building trust between people is a really important foundation. Um, for creating a human response. And this actually operates at multiple levels of the system. So it's about commissioners trusting the organisations that they fund to respond as they see fit. It's about um, the workforce on the ground being given the decision-making power um, to make decisions about what they are actually seeing in the day-to-day. -day. They are in the context that's complex. They, in, in, in um, collaboration with a person that they're supporting, are the best place to make decisions about what's needed. So it's about really trusting people at different levels of the system to make the right decisions and really devolving that decision making as close to people as, as we possibly can. Um, so in the words of, of Mark Smith, who's the, the um, Director of Public Service Reform in Gateshead, this means that public services are bespoke by, by default. It's about really tailoring services to, to the individual. Um, and some, some of the implications of this for commissioning are firstly long-term commissioning. If you're talking about relationships and trust, it takes a long time. You need to invest for the long term. It's about shifting away from performance measures and KPIs that can lead to gaming, that try and encourage us to focus on attributing change to a single organisation when, as Toby said, that just isn't the reality. Um, and finally, it's about commissioners and funders starting to think about how do we 
how do we support organizations that really um, build relationships, that build trust, that take a human response? So recognizing that as a really positive feature of the organizations you want to support. Um, so just, just to give an example there, so in Plymouth, um, they've got a contract that's supporting vulnerable adults, and that's a whole system response um, which actually doesn't have any KPIs attached to it. It's about spotting those organisations who can build good relationships, who are committed to learning, um, and they're held to accountable for those factors as opposed to, to rigid targets set at the outset. Closely linked to that is the second feature that we identified, which is learning. So, as Toby said, in a complex environment, learning is continuous. There is no such thing as what works because the context is ever changing. So what works is ever changing. So while traditionally we might have seen learning as a bit of a phase as in an innovation cycle. So you pilot something, you get some evidence, then you scale it up. What we're actually seeing is organizations constantly learning and adapting as the context around them changes, as they learn about how to improve what they're doing. So linked to what I was just saying about being human here, commissioners and funders are really focusing on organizations not necessarily the ones that can produce really nice date looking data um, but those organizations that are constantly learning and adapting and also those organizations that are sharing this learning across the whole system so the system can work better together to produce good outcomes then finally um, the, the third feature that we identified was the idea of a healthy system um, so often at the moment the way the way the world is wide is about organizations or about services so we, here we're seeing actually um, if we're going to work together well in complexity, we need to work better as a system. We're never going to be able to identify everything that's going on in the system and coordinate it all beautifully. It is complex, it is ever changing. But there's a lot more that can be done to break down silos, to coordinate, to collaborate better across systems. Um, so, some really important questions we're spotting here when it comes to healthy systems are so firstly, so who are the relevant actors in the system? How can we actually make, make the system more visible, spot who's doing what and, and think about how we can each play the best role rather than duplicating, rather than working in, in different silos? Secondly, the question of, do, we, do the actors in the system actually recognize it as a system? What's the shared purpose that, that binds a system and how can we make that more visible too? And then finally, what are the relationships between those actors? How can we strengthen them more? For example, how can we share data better? How can we learn together better? How can we um, work better in the interests of the people that we're supporting? And one of the really important roles that we've seen when it comes to creating a healthy system is the role of a system steward. So they're an actor, it could be a funder, it could be a commissioner, it could be a, a local charity. Um, these are people who um, take responsibility for creating a healthy system. So they're trying to create positive system behaviours um, in the absence of rigid KPIs and targets, it's about trying to kind of create the conditions so everyone knows what, what positive system behaviours are for. Langley Chase have got some brilliant examples of system behaviours that they've um, identified. So things like viewing yourself as part of an interconnected whole, having quality of voice and sharing power. These are the kind of behaviours that the system steward tries to embed um, and tries to, to um, encourage everyone across the system to work towards. And then just finally to, to finish up on some examples of different practices, as I've said, it's across many different organisations and spheres. I won't delve into these now, but I think it's, we really, we think it's really positive and it creates a lot of hope that we're seeing examples of this practice in so many different, different parts of the UK and in so many different, um, different spheres, whether it's funders, commissioners, delivery organisations. And, and as we come to the Q&A, we'll be able to dive into these a little bit more. That's great. Thank you, Dawn. And um, I really enjoyed reading some of the, those examples in the report. So a bit of a shameless plug to mm -hmm. this webinar is no excuse for, for, for downloading and, and, and reading the report because there's some really lovely ones and I'm looking forward to touching on those when we get into to questions. So let me um, transition to Hastings where we're going to be um, hearing from Claire talking about her experiences. Over to you, Claire. Great. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to talk about, um, well, from the perspective of a former uh, recent CCG commissioner, uh, I found this report really, really helpful. It brought some really um, welcome and positive challenge for health commissioners. I think particularly as we move towards the development of integrated care systems across the country, this is going to become uh, ever more important. And, and actually, the, there's some really practical and useful insights and examples in here that I, I think, again, as George has said, are, are really useful and, and well worth a, a look at. Um, I think that the issue is that commissioners really need to recognise that some of the more traditional tools of commissioning are not fit for purpose in the complex systems in which we're working. 
and they can actually um, constrain delivery of improvements in health outcomes rather than, than enable them in, in many cases. Um, I guess from, from a sort of a former commissioning perspective, we shouldn't underestimate though how challenging this shift will be for many health commissioners, as I think it requires a significant cultural change away from the more traditional them and us relationship with providers, which is often characterised by commissioners setting the price and specification for a service and then monitoring delivery against a set of key performance indicators and through regular formal contractual meetings. It's quite a formalised relationship in many in many cases. Um, and I think the shift that we need to see is for, for you know, as as has been covered already, that, that move to one of more co-production co um, and actually working together to design a service offer and ideally one that sort of sets the funding and high level outcomes to be achieved and then let staff on the ground use their professional judgment and relationships with patients to guide them rather than over specifying pathways or processes in great detail which is often what what's happened more traditionally um, I think we really the key for me is about how we can trust the intrinsic motivation of staff to do the right thing for patients and empower them to do so um, I think again as much as it's challenging for commissioners it can also be really challenging for staff uh, many of whom are not used to working in this way um, so I think we need to always bear that in mind as well um, and the example that I'll come on to talk about uh, kind of highlights where we had some some challenges uh, for that for, for staff um, but actually when you uh, embed that kind of scenario it can create much more satisfying work environments and actually support staff retention and again particularly critical at the moment when there's such workforce challenges actually you know how you uh, retain staff is, is, is really critical uh, so this can really enable that um, so I've got some direct experience of trying to create this shift uh, in uh, in, this, in this shift away from a more traditional relationship to one of more co-production. Um, so in my previous role, I led on the re-specification of community-based multidisciplinary services in our area. So the broad, what was a very broad service was actually very tightly specified in quite a traditional manner um, and didn't link up to other primary or community-based services. Um, so what we actually did was join the community nursing teams in, in neighbourhoods uh, to what was a sort of neighbourhood based health and care multidisciplinary team which wrapped around groups of practices um, and then we worked closely with those teams to redesign the service offer uh, on the basis that actually they knew much more about what made a successful service and what some of the key constraints and challenges were that were stopping them deliver than I did uh, and so that, I think that's another key point actually you know put it put the power in the hands of people who actually know what some of the challenges and service, service delivery elements are rather than commissioners setting a specification um, we wrote we you know we still had a specification but it was written giving a really high degree of flexibility for staff working in teams to use their own judgment and rather than delivering against a sort of checklist which was in the sort of previous specification we moved to one where for example when uh, you know a, a nurse was out visiting a patient in their own home they were able to look rather than just say right I've got these three tasks to perform and I'm going to leave they were encouraged to look more holistically at the patient environment and needs and really listen to what was important to them uh, and and to say if they noticed that they needed help with food shopping or needed some home repairs doing they could then work with the multidisciplinary team to get that picked up and addressed uh, so we worked collaboratively with the team on the specification but also to test out different interventions in different teams so we introduced the uh, concept of a daily telephone huddle with general practice in one team, tested it out, um, and then introduced it to other teams when it when it proved proved uh, successful. Um, but we did that kind of ongoing experimentation to learn what works, and then to share that learning, a kind of prototyping approach, um, rather than sort of uh, it was that ongoing learning which I think you know is, has come up in this report as important. Um, and whilst we did collect more traditional KPIs and metrics, um, like you know looking at non-elective uh, admissions. Uh, we used other metrics such as the patient activation measure, measure to see how service delivery promoted and increased patient activation to create positive life changes uh, and actually it paid dividends in across metrics so across more traditional metrics but also um, more kind of innovative ones too there was a sort of a significant reduction in non-elective admissions um, but also really positive feedback from patients carers and staff um, although as mentioned earlier um, you know, as with complex systems it's impossible to attribute 
um, to attribute any any success in metrics to to purely this intervention or set of teams or services, because we you know as we know in complex system there's a large range of other interventions that any any person receives at any one time. So I think again that's not always recognised with commissioners that you have to take those as as your you know your success and actually it's a it's a much wider uh, wider success point. So just finally, I, I, in thinking about my experience in terms of trying to commission services differently across the system, but also my work as part of Kaleidoscope, um, I think there are three critical elements you need to uh, ensure that these approaches uh, work. Um, so this is not exhaustive, this is just my view of, of what I think the three most important elements are. So I think you really need to have a, established a clear shared purpose and vision across the system, and you should really take the time at the outset to ensure this is in place. So, you know, take an afternoon, get a group of representatives from across the system together for a few hours to really get some clarity on that. I think it really pays dividends. Secondly, uh, having trust and relationships in place, it's already come up, but you, you know, you've got to all be on the same side working to deliver that shared purpose together. It's got to move away from that adversarial, more traditional relationship between commissioners and providers. Doesn't mean you all have to agree on everything. You've got to be working together to deliver the, the common purpose. And then thirdly, I think everyone's got to have some skin in the game and feel like they are able to influence and lead. So it shouldn't be based on a single kind of heroic leadership model or a small number of leaders within a system. Actually, everybody needs to feel that they are empowered to input and, and take that leadership. Um, so I think those three things from my perspective and experience in, in commissioning these sort of services, is actually if you don't have those three things in place, then it's going to be even more challenging. Um, so yeah, that's um, that's my reflections. Thank you very much, Claire. Really interesting to to kind of hear how you you tried to make it work on the ground in in, in real terms. So so, so fascinating. Um, so I think um, Toby started us off by saying no single individual organisation is responsible for the outcomes of a system, and in that spirit, I am going to relinquish my control and hand it over to the audience um, for um, questions and um, and our next session. So as a uh, next segment rather. So as a reminder, there are three ways to participate. Um, number one, you can um, write a message in the chat box on the right hand side interface of the, on your screen. Secondly, you can send us a um, email at hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare. Or thirdly, you can tweet at us using the hashtag um, what was it? Uh, human learning systems. So um, please um, do so. And we already had some questions coming in. So um, first question I'm going to take um, is, and I think I'll direct this at, um, I'm interested in Toby's um, reflections first, and then um, uh, the others can chip in. Um, number one, so this sounds all very nice, but is it actually possible given the level of challenges organizations are facing? Um, so yeah, great, great question and one that we get asked uh, frequently. Um, and so the best response we've got to that is that the practice that we've described is practice that's happening on the ground right now. So uh, yeah, we see um, uh, organizations uh, like Plymouth Council and CCG have just, uh, as Dawn was saying, created an 80 million pound 10 year systems commission a commission with that amount of public money with no output or outcome targets in it with uh, the accountability for, for learning and collaboration. So we know it's possible because these people are doing it. Uh, charitable foundations like the Tudor Trust and uh, uh, Lang Kelly Chase, again, significant amounts of resources um, uh, allocated, distributed to organizations on the basis of their capacity to learn, trusting organizations to, on the ground to know the right thing. Uh, we've also seen an absolute ton of uh, delivery organizations working in this way. So uh, Gateshead Council um, uh, completely changing the way that it did uh, it's um, uh, chase its council tax debt, kind of moving away from an enforcement model to a model where people, uh, uh, in, whether instead of sending the uh, bailiffs around, they sent people around to say, um, "We see you're in council tax debt. Uh, what can we build? A can we can we help? What can we do? What's going on for you? Build a relationship with you, and 
whatever it is that we hear and under, we hear from from you we'll do our best to help with it's real genuine bespoke public service uh, and voluntary sector organizations on the ground like uh, Mayday Trust who again transformed their uh, service offer from this is the standardized service that we offer to everyone to building a set of relationships and responding uh, th th there are if I was to list all the examples of all the organizations doing it, we would still be sat here in 25 minutes time. So we know that it's possible because organizations are doing it. Great. Um, maybe I'll ask Dawn, maybe um, not to list all the examples, maybe to pick <laughs> up on one that's a particular favorite that you might want to share to prove that, that, that this is actually possible. Yeah. Um, so I might pick up on the Mayday Trust one actually, um, because I think they felt like that not only is it possible, it's absolutely necessary. So their reflection was, so they work with homeless people and um, people facing tough times and their reflection was firstly, outcomes just aren't good enough. The current system is not working. And secondly, given the financial constraints we're operating in, carrying on as we are, it's just not an option. So we have to do something different. So they spent a lot of time talking to homeless people, talking to people experiencing tough times. Um, and that, that has driven them to adopt a completely different model. So it's, it's very, um, it's, it's not actually based much at all on services. It's actually based on um, supporting people with an asset coach, tapping into their, their strengths, their internal motivations, seeing what's important to them as an individual and trying to connect them into the community more. So they're not passed around services in an ongoing spiral of actually connecting to the community, finding their purpose and being embedded in the community for the long term rather than, than spiraling through services constantly. So they've, they've, they were kind of inspired by, we have to do something different. They really listen, they really co-produced as Claire was talking about. They've hit up against so many challenges along the way. Um, so they, as an organization, had to take the decision that actually they were gonna lose a lot of their contracts as a result of this. They lost half of their income um, at one point from taking this decision, but they were driven by purpose. They knew things had to change. Um, and they they developed a model that while, while they're facing challenges, there are increasingly commissioners that are picking up on it, picking up on the learning. Um, so yeah, they've also lost kind of 50% of their staff along the way as well. So I feel like they are at a point now, they've still got challenges, but they're, they're showing that it can be done and it's getting increasing traction. Yeah, that's really nice that they're able to kind of harness that burning platform yeah. as kind of a, a mm. case for change. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, well, our next question was actually um, directed at, at you, Claire. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go with that first. And, and but um, Toby and, and Dawn, feel free to, to add some comments. Um, so Claire, the question's from Bob from Stokes. So thank you, Bob. Um, Dawn mentioned no performance measures or KPIs. And um, he's particularly interested in, in your view, Claire, as a, regu as a former regulator, on the reaction this would get from NHS regulators. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's a, a, a big challenge. And I think most people would be uh, on a journey maybe towards a, a future where there is no KPIs. But I think, you know, I don't know, certainly from my perspective, it wasn't realistic particularly even where I was trying to do something in a different way, like I described, it wasn't realistic to think that I wouldn't be able to, uh, that I'd be able to do that without collecting some KPIs. Um, I guess the, the sort of, um, the, the approach we took was to look at a range of KPIs and actually link KPIs to specific outcomes. Um, and so we had kind of a, a sort of a three level uh, outcomes measure sort of approach. So we'd worked in co-production with staff, but also with patients to, to really focus on what was important to them uh, and to develop a range of uh, outcomes that were based on that. And then we linked key KPIs, um, a range of key KPIs to those outcomes. Ultimately, when we, so I wasn't actually procuring this, this as a new service, um, we were we were working within an existing within within existing contracts, but actually the aim was, you know, that that we were going to have to re-procure in future. Um, that actually we would move toward a full outcomes-based uh, approach in in any new procurement coming up. But actually, this was a, a, a journey towards that. Um, so actually, we we we'd already set the outcomes, but we were using a range of different measures. So you know, we did focus on very traditional KPIs like non-elective admissions, A&E attendances, because this was pre, you know, predominantly a service, although it was a whole population model, often what we were looking at was the frail elderly. And actually, you know, in the area that I came from, that we had a, 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 an increasing aging population. So actually managing our level of non-elective admissions and A&E attendances was a real priority for us. Um, but we also did it in, um, you know, in the spirit of actually looking at broader outcomes, really making sure that we linked to, uh, you know, 
things that were focused on what was important to people. So one of the things I mentioned was the patient activation measure, um, which it, you know it you can use in a very individualized way. So I think there is a way that you can, whilst we move towards you know a, a grand vision of integrated care systems of the future, I think most people aren't there. Um, so I think you know it, it will need a combination approach um, and actually to bring people along with you you can show actually we impacted on non-elective admissions but also look at look at the positive feedback we've got in terms of increasing people's patient activation etc and it helps bring people on the journey particularly people that are skeptical um, I think you know I think for most people it will be a, a journey towards uh, towards that approach rather than doing it straight off. Thanks Claire and I, I just pick up on one of my takeaways from from the report which was that measurements kind of of crucial importance mm -hmm. to this approach but not in terms of control or judgment, but more in terms of, of, of fostering learning. So I wonder if Dawn or, or Toby, do you have anything else to, to, to add to that? To uh, yeah, so I kind of um, would uh, heartily endorse Claire's perspective about kind of a journey towards uh, some of this, uh, uh, a kind of a, uh, a future with no KPIs. Um, and also picking up on your point that, um, one of the key things uh, people get very exercised rightly by the question what should we measure because it's an important question but actually it's a secondary question to the question why are we measuring and so you if you use measures for learning rather than as accountability tools so measures that enable a group of people to reflect on their work and and think how can we do better that's a brilliant use for measures. But when those measures become performance management tools, like key performance indicators, they will, it, the evidence is really, really, really clear. Those, uh, whatever those measures are, whatever those key performance indicators are, they will end up distorting uh, effective practice and undermining both the effectiveness and the efficiency of the work. So, uh, and, and this is the kind of the point I would like, um, make most strongly about this if people are interested in evidence-based practice the evidence is so clear that the use of key performance indicators undermines effective practice so kind of whatever journey people need to take to to kind of get that to to, to be able to use that evidence effectively that's the journey that's necessary great thank you toby um so our next question, and I'll direct this to anyone um, who wants to answer it, um, and um, it's from Sarah, and she thanks us um, for a fascinating discussion, and she asks, has austerity caused people to think harder about complexity or put them off? And um, I'd be interested in all of your opinions, but would anyone like to kick us off? So I guess that kind of picks up what I was talking about in Mayday yeah. for Australia. So we've got a slight selection bias because we've been spotting those examples that are doing this. Um, but through the examples we've seen, their response to, to austerity has been, we can't carry on doing the way, the, carry on doing things the way we have done. Um, we need to collaborate to um, do things more cost efficiently, to reduce outcomes, to reduce costs and also to improve outcomes for people. So yeah, the people that, that, that we've engaged with, it's been, it's kind of reinforced what is probably common sense. I would um, I would echo that. I mean, when you meant the comment before Dawn, uh, I think actually the 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 more the higher the degree of challenge and austerity, um, the more you need to do something radical. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, you know, it, it it can be easier. You know, there are it's getting to the point now, particularly in terms of staff capacity and uh, just you know uh, availability of resources. That actually, we have to do things as you said in a different way. Um, and actually. So I think it actually enables people to make uh, more radical changes rather than uh, actually if people are uh, comfortable and you think, okay, it's sort of working okay, but we could do better, um, then then those sort of changes won't won't happen so quickly. Just one, um, of the, sorry. one of the things we've seen people grappling with is the idea of kind of like tweaks around the edges versus fundamental change. Um, and yeah, a lot of the, the examples we've spoken to have said we tried tweaking around the edges, it just wasn't driving the change that we needed to. Mm -hmm. This is structural, this is cultural, we need to tackle these issues head on if we are gonna are gonna grapple with austerity and, and improve outcomes as well. Yeah, and that I would just say that that's that's been our experience as well, that um uh one of the things that 
so uh, one of the things that austerity has um uh, has shown and i mean you would never have wanted to kind of discover it by this route because austerity is a terrible thing and kills people but um uh it it has reduced the capacity um uh to overcome the inefficiencies of the new public management approach by throwing money at a problem so the new public management approach we know is an inefficient way to uh, respond to public service in complex environments um now there isn't the money available to mask those inefficiencies anymore and you, and that manifests in kind of the really senior people saying to us things like the greatest risk is the status quo and that when when you get leaders in that kind of mindset then that creates opportunities for change that's great thank you um so um a couple of questions um submitted by by jason martin around uh, the the theme of um of, of supplying and, and and procurement um i'll i'll kind of I'll group them and then i'm interested in in anyone's take but perhaps we'll go to to you, Claire, with, with some of that hands-on experience that, that you have. So the question is, um, how challenging is it to overcome the buyer-supplier relationship and, 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 and perhaps some reflections on, on that dynamic? And then secondly, and, and, and somewhat related, um, you know, Jason's experience indicates that there's often a, a significant difference between commissioners and procurement teams. And, um, and, and you know, can we explore perhaps their, their attitudes to, to co-design and, and collaboration um, and, and how specifically, you know, any strategies for getting the procurement teams on board as well as those commissioners? So uh, a meaty, meaty question mm -hmm. there. Um, we will go to Claire first and then I'll, I'll offer um, Dawn and, and, and Toby the opportunity to come back on, on that. Yeah, good, good questions. Um, I'll start with the one that I've probably got more of an answer or <laughs> more and more to offer. Uh, so in terms of the overcoming, you know, the, how challenging is it to overcome the buyer supplier relationship? Um, I think it, as I said in, you know, in my remarks, of certainly my experience previously in commissioning or from commissioning a, a, a long while ago, um, but even still recently is that it is that much more kind of it's traditionally more adversarial relationship. It's very much a them and us. You basically generally interact through fairly bruising contractual meetings, um, which are based around performance management and KPIs. Um, but actually where we had kind of uh, been able to overcome this was often about um, our joint appointments and sharing staff. Um, so we, uh, my team, um, I really encourage, so a lot of my team was, uh, I was commissioner for primary and community services. Um, a lot of my team was Focus quite a, little, a bit around provider development and supporting providers, particularly primary care, where there were significant challenges in my patch with uh, individual practices. Um, so I saw our role really as supporting providers as much as holding them to account. So obviously that was part of our role, and you know we held contracts, and that was that was part of the role. But it was almost like Toby was saying around the example I think uh, with uh, count, people in council tax debt. Actually, I don't think the best way to get uh, to get improvement with people is to sort of continue to hit them over the head while they're having a bad time uh, actually how can I work with you you know I, I want this to be a success I'm trying to commission services for our population I want them to be as good as they can be how can we work together uh, to improve that service offer and do something a bit different uh, and one of the ways so we had kind of quite open discussions with the kind of uh, with my kind of director equivalents in the providers um, to try and you know to, to try and get more of a, a, a good working relationship and build that trust uh, and one of the key ways we did that was we appointed, we, we did joint appointments. So in um, the kind of lead of my, looking at the example that I talked about earlier, when we were looking to redefine the sort of multidisciplinary team offer, uh, this, the, the manager that managed all of the teams in the patch uh, actually came and worked two days a week with me and two days a week with them. And then she was obviously out and about as well. Um, but she actually reported to me and also to the community provider so actually, we became, we were a t we were one team, um, and you know me and her and uh, her manager and the community provider met on a weekly basis, and it, it just it just eased that relationship. It didn't become about a monthly contractual kind of fight or debate. It was actually let's work through the issues that we've got. Let's work through the changes that we're all trying to create. Actually, you know, coming back to the the, the kind of key points I made earlier around. 
you know, what's our shared purpose? What are we trying to achieve together? What can we do together that we can't do separately? Um, you know, that we just came back to that again and again and again, not just with the senior management, but also with the teams. Let's just get together that all of those teams with primary care and the community providers, you know, across community services, mental health, social care, and let's really focus on what that shared purpose is. And actually, you know, that's how we built trust and relationships and it became less of a buyer, supplier, you know, commissioner, provider, adversarial relationship. Um, so I don't think there's any easy answer, <coughs> um, but I also wouldn't say that, <coughs> sorry, I also wouldn't say that it takes years. I think there's always this, or there can be this perception that trust takes years to build. Actually, within six months or so of, of starting those conversations, we really moved, you know, we leaped ahead massively. I think, you know, obviously a, a long term relationship is great, but I think often it can be used as an excuse to say, oh, well, it takes years. It's not, you know, we can't do anything now. Actually, I think there's lots of things you can do um, to help build those relationships in, in quite a pacey way. Um, the second question on procurement, I have less uh, <laughs> less success with. I think, you know, I think procurement teams can be are, are generally very risk first. That's their role. You know, often you would think in in developing a procurement, you're going to them for the sort of the full belt and braces legal advice. Their their role is to be that kind of <clears throat> stick to the letter of the law. But I think again, if you're working. What, what we did with our procurement people where we did procurements. Um, so we, I procured a primary care access service um, last year. We actually worked with the procurement team to, to define not just the process, but actually what, what, what we were gonna go through and those discussions we were gonna have with providers. So again, my advice would be, don't just ask them for one-off advice or to you know, put, the, put the necessary OG statements out, actually get them in uh, make friends with your procurement uh, <laughs> procurement advisor and actually get them as part of the process and, and get them in and join some of those discussions with your team but also with with other teams um I think you know I think that's 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 my that would be my answer but I don't I, I'm not saying it's, it's always an easy relationship and it, and it can be quite challenging but I think the more you get them involved and get them to understand what you're trying to achieve um, and also, you know, in, involve your kind of integrated care colleagues. You know, everyone is working towards integrated care systems now. You, if we're not going to procure in this traditional manner, it's just not that's not the way of the way of the world. So actually, um, how can we obviously work within the law and the legal framework, but actually do things a bit differently? Great. Thank you, Claire. That's fantastic. And um, before we take our next question, let me remind you that there are three ways to participate and ask questions. Um, number one, you can use Twitter with the hashtag human learning systems. Number two, use the chat box on the right hand side of your screen. And number three, send us an email, hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare. So thank you for so far for, for your responses panelists and for all the questions coming in. So let's go to the next one, changing tack a little bit. This is from Fred and Fred asks, um, well Fred um, would welcome the panel's reflection on the level of bravery required from leaders to go down this risk to do down this route and furthermore do you think it's a risky approach for nhs leaders in particular to take so how much bravery is required and then specifically um specifically for the nhs leaders is it um is, is it particularly risky so um maybe we'll start with toby and then um go to your next uh, uh, yes, so um, risky. So a, a couple of things. Firstly, I would refer back to the, the conversation we were having before that it, it stepping into um, a new set of practices is always going to feel risky because you don't have that kind of psychological comfort of, oh, we've been here before, we know what we're doing. But we're also in a situation where the greatest risk is the status quo. So there isn't a non-risky choice right now. So all the choices are risky. Um, and secondly, we, we've we actually got a, a really interesting example within our the, the people we've been working with of, of, of a leader displaying that kind of bravery. So when Plymouth were going, starting to go down this route, um, uh, and it's kind of, it's also a story about kind of procurement, uh, to pick up on Claire's point, they, um, uh the 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 commissioners said we want to work in this kind of radically different way the uh the procurement team kind of 
uh, went away and was like, how can how can we make this happen? They came back with a report that said, okay, we think we can do it like this, um, but we can't 100% guarantee that we won't get sued as a result of it. Um, and the leader made the, made a kind of decision that unlocked the whole rest of the process by saying, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, we will carry that as a corporate risk. And so it was that the bravery of the leader in that context to be the first mover to say, yes, we can do it, that has unlocked this as a set of practice for, for everybody else. Because now, now they did it, they didn't get sued. People understand that this stuff is possible now, that this, this uh, an alternative approach to commissioning, no KPIs and blah, 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 is, is a perfectly legitimate way of doing it. Um, so it does take bravery, but there isn't, everything requires bravery right now. Great, that was very well said. Claire, do you want any additional um, comments or should we go to the next question? Um, just briefly, I think that this question is about NHS in particular. I think, so as Toby said, kind of the, art, the possible showing that things can be done differently is really important. And also the role of peer support between different leaders we found mm -hmm. is really valuable in giving people that bravery, giving people that energy to carry on. Um, and one thing I'd say is so our work has kind of spanned across different sectors, health and beyond. And one of the really interesting developments we're seeing is leaders from health and, say, local authorities coming together and doing cross-sector systems leadership programmes, for example. Um, so I think it can make people in, in a, across a different place um, develop that bravery when they can draw on other people in a place, um, when they can point to other examples, other leaders, um, tackle some of the problems together, give each other peer support on the journey. So, yeah, I think looking beyond just health and seeing who else is out there in a place doing similar things <clears throat> can really support that bravery. And I think there is a, there is, you know, I, I totally echo what, what others have said. I think there is obviously a degree of bravery, but actually there's a degree of permission out there in the system. When you look at the long term plan, you look at the kind of integrated care system development, this is not, you know, it, when you think about it in those sort of terms of what what the NHS long term plan sets out and the aims of integrated care systems, it makes it seem less radical, I guess, in terms of or, or less less risky or or scary. So I think it does require a, a sense of bravery. But actually, you know, when you look at the kind of context that we're working in and the plans for the next 10 years, then actually there's a degree of permission there that we shouldn't forget. Great, thank you all. Um, so our next question is from Mohammed, and it is as follows. Developing new models of care requires individual organisations to look wider than their traditional responsibilities. How important is it to align funding streams and pots in commissioning to ensure that innovation and improving outcomes isn't stifled? So a question around aligning funding to ensure that we're not um, stifling innovation. So anyone want to pick up on that? Um, yeah, so could offer a, a kind of, a, again, a, a response based on experience for us is that it's, it's really crucial that the way that the money operates matches how people want the system to operate. So it's no good doing a bunch of kind of systems development work with actors in the system to kind of generate a set of different relationships and uh, 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 trying to build trust with people if then the money is allocated and the performance management happens in the same old way because that will destroy the trust and the the sets of relationships that have built up so kind of it, it's 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 is why we started this journey by talking about how funders and commissioners can work differently in complexity because from our perspective it's really really crucial that the money behaves dif behaves differently in a system and just to add to that, I think it's, it's also one of the hardest things. So in Plymouth, they had the benefit of working off an integration of budgets from the local authority and the health system. Obviously, that's not the, the context everywhere. So um, in other places, we're seeing kind of, as Claire described, a prototyping approach. So we can't we can't blend budgets across the whole system. But how can we in this small place at least have a, have a joint budget and test how that works and learn about what are the system conditions there that we can start to spread across the system? How can we test something here and make it feel a bit safer? To then to try and spread and embed that more widely. Um, yeah, I would echo that, echo that point in terms of um, you know aligning funding streams and pots in commissioning. I think there is or often often a risk with commissioners that they can you know be saying to providers, you need to work together, you need to collaborate. 
but don't don't do it themselves uh so i think you know commissioners need to work with providers actually as a system you we're all part of, of one system trying to improve population health um but also with uh you know with local authority commissioners uh you know public health i think yeah if you want um if you are the funder or commissioner you need to you need to you know uh you know uh walk the talk or whatever the phrase is and the increasing just, focus on place at the moment as well is a really good foundation for for testing the zone. yeah uh, and again one of the nice things about seeing places that have done it is that it offers a challenge to anyone who says oh we can't share budgets we can't align these things we can't pull budgets well what do you mean you can't they do and if they do why not you and that's also there's a, a history of of pooling budgets isn't that you know there there are there are mechanisms that have been around for you know more than a decade to 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 be able to pull budgets so there's really no excuse Great, fantastic. Um, well, unfortunately, we're uh, at the top of the hour. So, a big thank you to everyone who has um, asked and sent in questions and apologies um, if we didn't get to all of them. Um, let's continue the, the discussion on Twitter. Um, before we wrap up, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to share one closing reflection. So, um, really, really hard to do this after mm -hmm. such a wide ranging and interesting discussion, but I'm going to put you all on the spot and ask you to share one reflection each um i will go first and it's that um i think the the the, the thing that i hadn't quite appreciated was that the, the 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 outcomes are produced not by any single individual organization but systems as a whole and that is why it's really imperative that system leaders make the system visible to everyone who's a part of it and um i think i think that would be the, the key thing that i'm going to reflect on and think about how i can do in my work so um, we'll go in the order of speakers. So Toby, I'll ask you to go first. Um, so my reflection would be, from having done a number of these kind of conversations, this is my very first webinar, but uh, a number of the kind of events where we've been talking about this recently, um, the, the level of um, interest, energy, enthusiasm in working in this, in this way is really significant and really palpable and essentially all that it takes for people to work in this way is a sense of kind of collective mobilization that working in this way is possible so if people want to start working in this way kind of join in and it it becomes possible for people okay thank you Dawn. Yeah, I guess my reflection really echoes what Toby said. So it feels like the conversation is moving so fast. So two years ago, even a year ago, it feels like we wouldn't have had this conversation. So I think it's really positive, a sense of this is possible. We can do things. We don't know the answers, but we're all experimenting together um, is, is brilliant. And I would kind of echo that point about if we're thinking about systems getting beyond silos, let's try and connect the health conversation more with conversations going on more widely. I think there's lots of potential there. Indeed. And Claire? I guess my one reflection um, from from what's been covered, but also the, the questions we've had is, you know, it, it can be really tough, particularly in times of austerity, it can be a really tough place to work in health and social care uh, or, you know, in this sector generally. And actually, there's something about working in this way that that, that kind of uh, colleagues have, have set out that's actually really satisfying. Um, so, it, you know, it can create really great, great outcomes and improve outcomes for patients. But actually, it's really satisfying for staff in commissioners, in providers. Uh, you know, staff working on the ground, and I think we should just remember that, particularly in a in a in a time when actually, you know, capacity is really challenging. Actually, I found working in this way a much more satisfying uh, way to 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 you know spend my time rather than in kind of you know, adversarial contract meetings. Actually, working together to deliver something that was that was better. So I think um, uh, I think we should all just remember that in in thinking about this. Fantastic. I really appreciated that upbeat tone of those those final reflections. Thank you, everyone. Um, so um, as, as we're just about to wrap up, um, two housekeeping things. One, shortly after this webinar, you will receive a um, quick survey evaluation. Please do um, fill it out. It will take less than a minute and um, will enable us to continuously improve digital events like these. Um, and secondly, there will be a link to the recording so that you can watch this again from the future. 
So finally, let me thank everyone for your fantastic participation. Um, Nat and Rich, who tirelessly worked behind the scenes to um, organize all the logistics of this, and to our fantastic panelists, two of whom, not that you'd know, this was their first webinar. So thank you for doing such a um, splendid job, Dawn and Toby, and thank you, Claire, for, for, for joining us as well. So have a marvelous afternoon and a magnificent weekend, and thank you again for joining. Thanks.